And so eventually we're going to have this huge bubble and it's going to burst and it's going to have to be a reset of what the new form and foundation of money should be. This is The Mooncast. See you, space cowboy. Yo, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. I know you have a wealth of knowledge to give on the real world asset space. And I know we spoke a little bit at the Penn Blockchain Association event, the first one in, in Sofia. And uh, I would love for you to just introduce yourself a little bit to the audience, who you are, why you got into crypto, your crypto journey so far. And yeah. My background is uh, in terms of uh, more technical. Uh, why go to maybe why I go into the crypto? Because I like the idea of that the centralization and that something new, that emerging technology. Uh, I I always I I always want to be on the on the wave, like on the top of the wave, which is the cutting edge, which technology is. Uh, for how long I have been in the software space, since uh, I was like nine, I have tried a lot of things, failed many times. Like uh, that's why uh, all these uh, business coaches that are saying you can do it for one year, etc. <laughs> it took me nine years just to start like uh, doing business in terms of to be a little bit more stable. Mm. So for the for the people that uh, uh, that are telling that you can do it in one year, I want to learn from them how. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but basically, yeah, I'm 25 uh, years old. Uh, I'm on the start of my journey. What I can say, uh, I'm open and for anything that is interesting, but mainly in the web space right now, because that's my focus. I think uh, a person can do a lot of things, but if they are in certain range. For me right now, the range that I'm focusing is the web three. So I mm -hmm. think do there. Uh, my spam of, uh, my spam in terms of professional profile is with three narratives, let's say, this is welcome, time to be salesman, softer. Uh, that's like the spam I thought. And basically, uh, that's why I enter in the crypto, because in the crypto you have the, the sales, <laughs> you mm -hmm. have the, the software development, and yeah. sometimes you have something that nobody understands why this phone is working, but it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, yeah, I like the venture. So it feels like a venture you're entering. So I hope yeah. I answer all of your questions. Yeah, I, I appreciate that intro, man. It's, it's really, really good to have you on because for you to be the age that you're at right now, you're just, for me, in my, in my opinion, way farther ahead than a lot of people, you know, that are maybe looking into getting into the crypto space, getting into the industry. What can you say to people that are in the early 20s in their, in their teenage years and they're thinking and they're interested in blockchain technology or in the crypto space but they don't know like where to start how to start what advice could you give to them specifically i the best advice i can give them just do it right this is for me the best advice most of the people are just too scared to start like and this is the like 70 percent of the people i think they fail because they didn't start it <laughs> ever, right? Yeah. So if you don't start it, you're failing 100%. Uh, yeah. and basically, what I can say that the people shouldn't be scared of what they don't know, because I think because I think as a person that no matter how much you know, you always will know not. Right? Yeah. So much things, the space is so vast, and maybe this is what yes most of the young people that uh, everything is so vast and mm -hmm. basically right now people are used to like to very easily uh, get certain information or very easily get dopamine through the social media 
and mm-hmm. they are not very uh, strict on uh, certain uh, matter, like to be strict of doing something that you can learn from the martial arts, like to yeah. every day to do 100 kicks, 100 punches and to do it every day and this is what is giving the outcome. Like uh, when you just start in terms of crypto, there is a lot of things that are complex. Mm-hmm. But if you spend more hours, you will understand that. And probably the best advice is for them is just to do something without uh, saying that uh, they don't want to proceed because of the hardness it gets. Yeah, mm-hmm. for me it's like a, a certain let's say line which is going up so it's getting harder harder and then it's dropping down yeah because when you reach the hardest point on the top it's easy to go down <laughs> absolutely man and what about because a lot of issues i think people that i've spoken to especially from the zoomer gen z generation is the fact of being able to get the right information how how do you go about sourcing in the beginning stages of when you were learning sourcing the right information and getting the the right knowledge that you needed to be able to excel you excel uh your crypto career in terms of crypto what i it depends on what kind of knowledge you're aiming to learn yeah. If you want to learn how to think the technical knowledge, uh, for me it started a little bit differently because uh, in the beginning I, I had a lot of experience in the tech. And basically a lot of the concepts in the tech space, I, I have already played with them. Mm-hmm. So basically mm-hmm. what I did in my experience, I just opened the, the open Zeppelin or certain like uh, uh, well-known sources mm-hmm. who you can refer the tech, I open the, the Ethereum uh, documentation, etc, etc, and start like looking and playing with them a little bit. In terms of the, the groups and the, uh, the business, let's say, knowledge, <clears throat> I think you can learn it only if you have created a project and you have tried. Uh, we had one project launch work which we failed and we refunded all the money to all the people. We didn't launch it on the We didn't got enough to launch it. And basically, this experience is like very valuable. And it is helping you to, um, to have a bit more understanding what is right and what is wrong. So basically, I think they can, if they are going for development, and if they're going especially for the main change, they can start looking for the protocols that are established and start learning from them how the things are, are uh, working, etc. If they're going for a business development, I think the best way is to volunteer in successful projects or go into the project that is like uh, going to launch and mm-hmm. just doing this launch is if you're, if you research, first thing you have to research who is the team because there, you know, there's a team who have a very successful project, not only one. And mm-hmm. when they when they're launching, they have a very good, like very professional one with everything, with uh, everything is up to the, the point. And basically, for me, if you want to go with the business marketing or etc., you have to join launch of very good project or middle tier project and basically see things how are going. What I found out is very interesting that maybe eight percent of the people in the book say they don't know what they are doing there. <laughs> yeah. So it's true. So basically if you learn a little bit more from the people that they don't know what they are doing, you're in 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 this twenty percent that already know something. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you say to people that are listening and watching that maybe are from, let's say, more developing countries and think that they can get access to those kind of opportunities? Because, you know, you've been in the crypto space, you understand the how the crypto space works, where it's more inclusive and anyone who has a, the, the requisite skill set will be able to get the job or the position or whatever. But what can you say to anyone who is maybe discouraged and thinks that, hey, 
I won't be able to get access to those opportunities just because I live in, I don't know, Kenya or I live in Albania or, or somewhere like that. Basically, what I, I will go to is like trying to search the fundamentals of the software development, right? To search something that is connected to C++ or something that is connected to these base languages that are very powerful in themselves and learn how the, the language is working because C++ is some, for some people a very hard language but uh, it will give you a very good fundamental of so how the memory is working, how the different uh, storages, and uh, how to create a good code for people can uh, use uh, some kinds of like uh, start searching for some kinds of books or etc which is all about the this programming languages that I said as fundamentals mm -hmm. I will probably pick to learn C++ and then I will probably move to base if I'm going to blockchain I will probably try to learn Solidity or Rust or something that is in this main chains like Ethereum or Solana and that's what I will, I will aim for in terms of programming languages and for after that uh, probably try to find a certain job in some company that could provide me with uh, some kind of setup and then I will try to move on from this do you think Ethereum is the future? Mm, in terms of Ethereum, uh, I cannot say what is the future, but I think it Ethereum will stay <laughs> because it's a big infrastructure and yeah. basically a lot of people are developing on this infrastructure and it will keep on living because the people are improving it. But is it the future? I don't know, but I, I think it will be part of the future. <laughs> yeah. Basically. And when you look at in terms of the narratives, right, you're very much keen on and have a lot of information on the real world assets uh, sort of vertical within crypto. Because a lot of people don't know there's different verticals within crypto. You know, you have meme coins, you have decentralized physical infrastructures, you have gaming, you have AIs. And so there's so much different verticals that you could NFTs and et cetera, and et cetera. So with the real world asset space, how do you see it evolving in the next first of all before before i ask you that question what is real world assets specifically so for the audience so they can, can you break it down for them simplistically so they can understand what real world assets are and why they're so important in the current uh landscape of crypto i think uh most of the people refer uh to real world assets uh are businesses or operations who have uh let's say uh, a simplicity web 2 and web 3 kind of operations in terms of real world assets can be a, a mining facility that has a token and you can buy uh, equipment with this token so this is a mm -hmm. way project in terms of in narrative depth uh, or you can why, have a, why, why would somebody do that uh, they will do it because they will need to uh, help in terms of funding so to grow their facility and basically to uh, use this token for a certain operations that are in their facility like if you have a gpu facility you can rent with your token the gpu's power yeah and basically most of the people in terms of rwa narrative are trying to do some kind of uh, i wouldn't say uh revenue share models because uh, of the it, it will become security but mm -hmm. some kinds of reward uh, rewards that were are coming from the real business that you can reward your community with certain incentive they can be fiat or whatever uh, yeah. and that's yeah, when, thing. i was gonna say when you look at because i, I just want to stop you real quick and just talk a little bit because for me real world assets in the crypto space have been around since stable coins because i i see stable coins the form of real world assets because you're tokenizing a real world asset which isn't really real but dollars or a fiat 
and you're tokenizing that on chain and you're backing that one to one and making it more simple and easy for people to transact that value and also people then have access to let's say sort of uh, liquidity that they didn't weren't able to get access to before so if you're living in like i don't know ecuador maybe it's harder or if you're living in let's say like kenya you know with kenyan shillings maybe it's harder to get access to let's say us dollars right and so the ability to tokenize those real world assets gives people an opportunity to be able to swap that fiat into us dollars and maybe slows down their um, loss of or the hidden loss of uh, their their wealth right because at the end of the day it doesn't really matter what fiat you're, you're swapping into it's it's all inflating just at different rates and i, I guess the the dollar is seen more as a safe haven because it just is able to inflate slower just because of the global reserve currency and so i just wanted to mention that point real quick so the audience can understand you know the landscape of how broad real world assets are but you can you can continue because I, I didn't want to cut you out i know you were talking about something no. No, yeah, that is that is the point that it can be different varieties of uh, structure and businesses. In terms of the stable coins, uh, I, do, I don't think like they're providing infrastructure for mm -hmm. fiat on ramping or etc. Yeah. They are saying that they are storing somewhere the fiat. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 really, no, nobody really knows this is true or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have a, this is like a different use case of the RWA. You have this use case, you have people who are doing something with the hardware itself and they're uh, doing some kind of renting, but uh, they are different, let's say, uh, RWAs in terms of the stable coins. Uh, they are not like giving uh, certain rewards to their users or or etc. In terms of like, if I buy the USD, if I don't do anything, will I receive a reward? No. No, you, you won't, but you could engage in a smart contract and you could stake it and then you could get, I guess, what they consider, because what they're doing is they're actually in the back end taking so when you buy the actual USDT, for instance, what they do is they take that fiat and they buy US Treasury bonds with it and then they give you a percentage of the yield from that split. So it is sort of a, a form of a monetization strategy for everybody. So yeah, they what are, are you going to say? Yeah. In the liquidity pools, they are providing more USDT. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that that's one of the the I guess strategies that I think people use. Would you consider NFTs real world assets? Depends uh, what is their structure. Real NFT could be a real world asset when you are saying that the NFT will be used for uh, kind of uh, shares or something that is uh, validating uh, a document or. Uh, giving a permission to something, uh, you can put a put a house contract on NFT. <laughs> so yeah. it is in terms of that, it is a real world asset. So basically, NFT for a lot of people, maybe they are, uh, maybe they are thinking of the board tapes, <laughs> that is mm -hmm. like that. But in in real terms, NFT is non fungible token. Uh, which can be represented as a different uh, structures, like uh, the from the different uh, papers to different permissions to different uh, verifications. Uh, it can be used for a lot of things. Yeah, and do, do you think that NFTs will be part of that future of when we start digitizing these uh, legacy analog systems of storing things in filing cabinets, you know, because in a lot of countries and a lot of systems they're putting in place in a lot of corporations, they still store things in old filing cabinets, especially when you look at logistics too as well, which is uh, one of the problems that we're trying to solve too as well is trying to digitize those, um, those logistics documents and also have them verified on chain or link them to a transaction hash on chain. So just trying to play with different sort of uh, implementations using the technology to leverage it. And do you, do you see NFTs being a big sort of uh, uh, evolution in that sort of um, digitiz digitalization movement, especially when you look at the deep fakes that are happening, you know, currently right now. And uh, I always saw NFTs as a, as a form of which 
you know, you could use as uh, digital verification to alleviate issues so people can know, okay, was this, is this really sourced from the real person or not? You know, is this, is this fake news or not? How do you see that evolution of NFTs and how they play in real world assets and also potentially with the emergence of artificial intelligence and all these deep fakes and everything like that? I think they do, that, that will be the tool that will give some kind of uh, verification uh, for what is real and what is not. What I mean by that, in terms of, let's let's have in mind like the bank. If you want mm -hmm. the bank statement, you're going to a bank. They're sign, signing you document that you have, let's say, a thousand dollars. With the NFT, the same thing. You can just have a one kind of NFT contract that you can deposit this thousand dollars, and you can give it as verification to someone that you have this kind of money. Yeah. Uh, and so they can do a lot of things in terms of the notary. When mm -hmm. you're buying a house, you need a notary document to, uh, to be signed from them. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of like uh, NFT, you can, someone can have the, uh, the document, which is the NFT for the ownership of the house. You're just buying the NFT and that is it. The mm -hmm. transaction is verified. So basically, I think it will make the things more easier and it will remove a lot of middlemen that they don't want to be removed. Yeah. And do you, because where do you think, where do you see the adoption for NFTs being accelerated the quickest? It, will it be more in Eastern Europe? Do you see it more in Africa? Do you see it more in like the Western Europe? Or how do you see the, the adoption in terms of the rapid pace of it? developing in the depending on the geographic location that um, that technology is at I think the Europe will, or USA or this let's say old kind of countries uh, yeah. that have already uh, uh, like, let's say a legacy system in them they will move very slowly and won't adapt that fast I think like people from El Salvador or countries like that will adapt very fast because mm. they can move very easily. In terms of yeah. dif the different country jurisdictions in Europe, they cannot move very fast because they are connected to the Euro European Union. And the European yeah. Union is a uh, jurisdiction which is uh, very slow because a lot of people and a lot of countries are connected to it. And uh, countries like El Salvador, they're, they're independent in this kind of stuff, and they mm -hmm. are just can very easily improve and adapt. Yeah, yeah, it, it, makes, it makes sense. What, what, do you, what do you think about the future of the adoption of crypto in Bulgaria? Like, how do you see it from, you know, you're, you're a native, so... How do you see the, the regulatory landscape and the future of cryptocurrency in Bulgaria? Mm, it will depend on how our institution will how handle the Mika itself. That's why this pan vocal situation was created, so it can uh, very fast move with this regulatory uh, frame and embed it in our country with the best uh, walls in terms of uh, the whole frame. Because mm. uh, the frame, you can apply it like with the best walls, but you can apply it with the, like, the worst walls. Yeah. And so basically what we are aiming with this situation is to apply this Mika with the best kind of uh, walls in, in Bulgaria. So, in, in, in that set, uh, it depends on uh, how the government will react. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at the RWA space, how do you see it making an impact or how can it make an impact in Bulgaria's economy currently right now, today? Uh, it will be the same as you said in Kenya or other countries and uh, that don't have access to that much of a funding. For me, the 
AW Space is giving a war to the large public who, ha who have some kind of capital mm. to invest in you and give the opportunity to play in the big game. Yeah. So basically, for not only for Bulgaria, for any country, it will give us a lot of chances to a people who doesn't have access to a funding, and they can show their project to the world uh, and see how the the world will react to their project, and if the project is valuable, they they will fund it. I don't, I don't talk about meme coins or Burj Khalifa projects. <laughs> but if the project is uh, valuable, the people will fund it. And that yeah. is the interesting. So if you look like if your business, let's say you create mm -hmm. business here in Bulgaria, yeah. how do you go to the worldwide market? You need to find the connections to go to the event, to search for uh, people, clients, etc, etc, etc. In terms of crypto with one launch token or RWA, you're going to the whole world and yeah. the world can see you. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing that I really enjoy about crypto. I call it the freest form of financial capitalism in, in the entire world. And it's the purest form of it. And I, I think that you can't get those kind of opportunities in any other kind of market currently right now today. So yeah, it, it makes absolute sense what you're saying. And you mentioned something too as well about meme coins. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, Vanek just launched the indice for meme coins to track their volatility. So uh, my question to you is basically, do you see meme coin, meme coins potentially becoming an ETF index? <laughs> they can potentially become a volume index because they are generating a lot of volume. But yeah. I don't know. People are strange, bro. Like. Like Elon Musk can tweet, I will submit a like a ETF for meme coin, and people will say, "Let's go, let's do it." Like yeah. it depends how if there's someone who has a lot of influence and it's crazy enough, he, probably it's possible. Everything is possible. Hey, bro, I'm just trolling. It's something that will not just challenge your perspective, but also touch your heart and soul. It's a book that defies convention blending art and literature into a thought-provoking masterpiece, a reflective piece of provocative art that tackles societal constructs from angles you've never considered. Hey bro, I'm just trolling delves into the very essence of our existence. It questions the technology that surrounds us, challenges our notions of beauty, stares unflinchingly into the eyes of death, and questions the boundaries of freedom. It scrutinized the educational system that molds our very future. This book is a journey an exploration of shared human experience. And it's a work of art that refuses to be confined by tradition. It's a canvas painted with words, a melody of thought, and a testament to the power of creativity in a world dominated by algorithms and data. Visit moonboycapitalventures.com and get your hands on Hey Bro, I'm Just Trolling Today. It's not just a book, it's a movement. Now let's jump back into the show. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I made a joke about it last, I think it was last year in my podcast, you know, but I, I just kind of try to let people and emphasize to understand that meme coins are kind of like part of the internet culture. And I just don't, I don't see, foresee them going anywhere anytime soon. And the free market decides what's valuable. So they decide to put their money into meme coins and gamble, then by all means, let them do it. I mean, you look at uh, lottery tickets, or if you look at, you know, the gambling industry, even in Eastern Europe, it's quite huge, even though people don't make that much uh, money per month, you know, they still go to the casinos. And you don't see anybody like stopping them. Like, hey, whoa, what are you doing? You know, it's just too speculative, <laughs> you know. So I just feel like meme coins are more of a raw version of that, of people wanting to speculate. And I think if the free market wants to speculate, they should be able to speculate on whatever they want to. Yeah, it's free. But what I think is because we are going down right now in, the, in a recession, we're in a recession right now, and we, yeah. don't, we don't know where is the bottom of the crisis. But what is interesting in terms of the crisis and the recessions is that people are more gambling friendly. They, uh, the more the crisis going to the bottom, the more uh, friendly gambling they become. 
Like, yeah. In terms of meme coins, I think in the crisis they will pump a lot because people will search where to make money and uh, the best gimbal will be the meme coins. So a lot of money will go in the meme coins just because people want to gamble and, and want to search for the short path to make money. But there is no short path. And yeah. Then, and I think that will pump a lot the meme coins because that's a very interesting uh, trend. Uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, researched by the casino players. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are saying that it will, uh, like in terms of uh, a crisis, the people become uh, more addicted to gambling. <laughs> That's funny. I, we, what do you, why do you think that is? Is it because people get so desperate to get so pushed to the edge that they look for any way to make money really fast? Yeah, I think this is the uh, the mechanism that is pushing them to do gamble. Basically, yeah. well, there's one study that I recently read that uh, the online casinos have increased uh, in terms of users and volume. Oh wow! Really? Within the, within the past what twelve months or? Yeah, because of that uh, that we're going to recession. So it's I think the meme coins are like this casino, online casinos. So basically, I think they will hit all time highs. But let's yeah, see. I could, yeah, I, I could definitely see it. I, I will, you know, as a disclaimer, I am positioned in, in in meme coins. I am, you know, I do have a small percentage of my of my portfolio. Into the meme coin casino, man, because, you know, they're not going anywhere anytime soon, man. <laughs> and so I think it's good to just get a little small percentage allocation, you know, like it doesn't need to be so much. I, I wouldn't say to over leverage and put like one tenth of your portfolio, like 10% allocation into meme coins. I mean, I, I know somebody, you know, personally that put, you know, half of their portfolio into just meme coins and just diversified into memes. So we'll see how that turns out for him, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, <laughs> There's one friend of mine who just had that much capital that he bought all the the memes that will pump. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, he made a lot of money, but he bought all the positions. Man, to each their own. You know, this is everybody has their own strategy. Some people are just trying to be in the market to make like a like a good clean three to five x and then get out. You know, and then there's others that like. Oh no! I want to get a hundred x or a thousand x. I think it just depends on your goals as a person. On um, you know when I when I because I have clients that I do portfolio structuring, restructuring for. And, you know when I sit down with them, when I talk to them, or when I text them, I just tell them first. I ask them what is your goal. You know <laughs> because depending on your goal is how we can structure your portfolio, or get it structured in the right way to be able to achieve that goal within this liquidity cycle. So I think it really just depends. You know for some people they. They simply just want to double their money, triple their money. And for instance, like there's so many ways to make money in crypto. Like I'll, I'll tell you one with one of my buddies, what he does is he only invests in pre-sales, right? So he that's all that's all he does in crypto. So he invests in illiquid assets and then he trades those illiquid assets in the OTC market at a 2x. And so that way he, <laughs> he doesn't lose any money, you know, and that's how he plays. And he's like, I'm fine with with a, with a 2x and I'm out, you know. And he'll maybe, let's say, let's say, just hypothetically speaking, I don't want to dox how much he has, but let's just say in this example, like 100K in pre-sales, and then he'll just start trying to 2 to 2.5X in the OTC markets to trade them in to people who are interested, but then missed out on the initial allocation because, you know, there's only a specific amount of allocation before the, the cap, right? And then um, if the project is getting really hyped up, he can even trade it for a little bit more, you know, because people are like, oh, it's going to do more than 3x when it launches. I might as well buy it now before it goes in the open market. But, you know, so that's a way in which he does it. That's one strategy. Another strategy that I have another buddy that all he does is he just only does uh, crypto mining, crypto noting. So that's literally all he focuses on is he finds these these low key projects, you know, like the heliums of the world, you know, before they, they become huge. And then he starts mining those, earning like, let's say, a few hundred bucks a month, and then maybe they 10x, you know, and he'll he'll sell off the profits, you know, during the bull run, and he does that for multiple, like like 10 to 15 different projects. So, 
I don't think there's one specific right answer, you know, in crypto. It's just what you're mainly comfortable with. But I don't know what you think about that. Uh, I think there's a lot of strategy. Yeah. There are people who are arbitraging. There's people who are uh, uh, buying uh, market making. There's people who are uh, searching for, uh, as you say, a couple of uh, pumping gems and they're buying them on the low cap. Some people who are good, good in pre sales, some people who are mining, some people. There's a lot of different like scenarios that you can make money. That's why that is the interesting part that it is one space, but people are so creative in finding different scenarios to make money. And there's people who, who probably have a scenario that we don't know. Yet. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the magic about crypto is because you're you're only as limited as your imagination, I feel like in crypto. So you just need to be very, very imaginative. Like even there's people that just farm airdrops and I have somebody in my research group and that's all he does is he just farms airdrops, you know, and he's really, really good at it. So he think he's made he's made well over five figures in the past, you know, 12 months just farming airdrops, you know, and for some people that's like, you know, two to three years worth of salary, the amount of money that he's made, you know, if you're looking at like 30 or $40,000 that you've made in a 12 month time span, for some people, that's like three years worth of, of their salary or four years worth of their salary. Um, because most people aren't making in the world more than like one or two K per month, you know? So yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of definitely interesting strategies. And another thing too, that you mentioned too, as well, I found interesting was about the recession, because I actually think that we've been in a recession since 2022 and actually i'm going to actually break it down in my linkedin and uh for people to to understand because i was talking about this stuff in my research group about back in 2022 you know this is when i was getting into the market you know after the ftx crash you know the banks were failing and i was like this looks like we had two negative quarters of gdp growth you know <laughs> so i was telling my research group i was like this looks like we're in a recession right now, you know, so I'm going to get in, I'm going to allocate at 17K, get, in, get into BTC, and uh, I'm going to go hard, I'm going to go aggressive in, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not on Twitter, so I just, I don't have this psychological hurdle of scrolling on a timeline and having that influence my decision making, and I know that's like a lot of people have that, but for me, I just kind of make my allocation decisions based off of data and data alone. And so for me, when I was looking at it, it was like, oh, well, it looks like, you know, the market's bleeding to negative quarters of GDP growth, uh, venture capital slowed down. It's, venture capital is at its lowest in terms of uh, allocation since 2018. So people aren't putting up money and aren't cutting checks. So you just look at all the indicators and you look at also the unemployment uh, rates too as well. It, it, there's so many indicators, you know, that said that we were in a recession since Q4 2022. You know, but I don't know what what you how you how you see that or how you view that, and what your thought process is on um, the recession or the recession that they haven't called yet publicly. Mm, my thought process about it is that we are in a, we were in a recession, but with this uh, COVID, uh, I think uh, this that when the COVID uh, hit and when mm -hmm. they used uh, this kind of uh, they. What, I, I forget what they give to the people, they, but they stimulus. give uh, certain stimulus uh, and this slowed the recession down, but mm. it made the drop to be from higher point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting uh, perspective for sure. Yeah, I, I think the stimulus for sure, it slowed things down. I think they're very in a very, very interesting point right now because the interest rates are high. Inflation is very sticky, so they can't really inject more capital into the markets. You still have banks still getting squeezed, failing, you know, and then you, you see the bond market is crashing too as well. So that's also very interesting. <laughs> yeah, and between, I think, February and March, like two, uh, I forgot which one, but two or three more banks failed. And they yeah. were, one of them was acquired by JP Morgan, I think. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's going to continue to happen because as we all know, banks are operating on like 1% liquidity. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, it's absolutely insane that people this don't understand the, that. <laughs> the sh the, this is a shit coin, bro. 
but yeah, <laughs> it's the, <laughs> the biggest Ponzi. Yeah, this is the biggest Ponzi. Access uh, shit coins where founders have dumped the project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know the banks have a really good business model because they're when you know normal business when you're not making any more profit, well, you eventually go out of business. But with banks, when they're not making profit and they go to zero. They just get a liquidity injection and just continue. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're very good at that, like to add more liquidity. <laughs> yeah. The sources, but the sources are the same people who are giving them money. Yeah, it's it's absolutely insane, and you know, I'm I'm happy people are slowly starting to wake up because we're in this age of information technology, and people are starting to seek answers, especially during these these times, these hard times. You know, when people are getting squeezed. They start looking for answers and starting to f figure out like, wait, what's going on? Like, why the prices keep rising? Like, even here, like when I first moved here in Bulgaria in 2022, um, this is like Q3 2022. I I did a real estate contract for a year, you know, with my with my landlord, and I was paying 650 levs. And now today, oh, at the end of this month, she's gonna raise it to 800 levs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everyone, it's raising the the money keep inflating, but uh, I think one of the you know there's one uh, interesting book, uh, the foundation. Mm. By who? Basically, uh, Isaac Asimov. Uh, okay. It's told that most of the people who are going in CIA have read this book. Mm, it's more okay. about geopolitics. But what is written in this book is like there's certain uh, there's a galactic empire, and basically someone is ruling the galactic empire, and because of a lot of mistakes that have like uh, have staked 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 through the time, and will explode the bubble, the the galactic empire will fail, and there will be a, a like a dark ages, let's say. That. Like mm. a recession or whatever mm -hmm. basically they're creating the foundation just to uh, like decrease the time of the dark ages not to not to miss them but uh, like to decrease it basically the I think it was I'm not a finance guy but I think it was so stupid with these stimulus in the COVID because they increase the dark ages. <laughs> yeah. So because the the it was the economy was stimulated by unreal not yes. liquid money, let's say. Yes. It's the same as if you have a fixed amount of ethers and mint more ethers, you do the value of the E. Yeah. And and basically it is the same what it happened. Like they they just made it worse. Uh, yeah. They tried to stimulate the economy with with printed money, yeah. which in in short term it is making the pump, but in long term it will dump from a higher ground. Yeah, yeah, and you know the the sad thing was that it separated more so the people who have money and the people who don't because the people who were in assets during that time frame. I'll give you an example too as well was with just one sector in, in the United States for instance was the the restaurant industry and um, what ended up happening was that they basically um, these people went out of business and the government basically gave them free free money you know they were like hey look give us your tax return on the amount of revenue not profit <laughs> the amount of revenue that you made the previous year and we'll match that for your loss for this particular year. And that's how they injected uh, money into the restaurant industry and not everybody got the stimulus. So you had some people who made, let's say, cause you know, it's restaurant industry, bro. The margins are like 10% or less, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so if you make, let's say $3 million, you're, you're, you're gonna, your profit is actually $300,000, you know? And so they gave those people, instead of $300,000, $3 million in liquid cash as a subsidy so they could keep their restaurant running and this was all lobbied with like an organization that helped to lobby this to happen and not everybody got the stimulus, 
right? So you had some people who had like now a competitive edge because let's say you just got a, a random liquidity injection of $3 million, which is basically 10 years worth of uh, working, you know, for you. <laughs> you, know? you got it all at one time in one year. So they were buying, you know, real estate with that. They were able to get push advertising to, to run other people out of business. They were able to do better, better marketing and so on. So this is the type of stuff. This is just one industry, bro. There was others, you know, and not everybody got it. And that was the, the messed up thing. So all it did was just separate the hardworking people, you know, from the people who um, were in assets and were fortunate enough to be able to get that liquidity injection, that boost. And um, so I think the middle class is, um, is getting eradicated. They're getting squeezed completely. And there's just going to be, you know, um, people who are, you know, in that 20, 30, 40 million dollar range and then people who just aren't. And, you know, as the currency continues to get inflated and it gets to a point where people can't they get squeezed so much, they can't afford, you know, basic foods and groceries and everything. There's going to be a, a reset right at some point, because how, how else are you going to fix this this issue of because prices will never go back down and wages will never keep up. So and they will never be able to pay off the debt that they owe, they meaning the government. So you have this huge issue of okay, people aren't making enough money and then people aren't spending money because they're not making enough. So the businesses aren't getting stimulated enough. So the government's not getting enough taxes. So how do they cover the loss? Well, they have to print more money <laughs> to cover the loss. <laughs> and so eventually we're going to have this huge bubble and it's going to burst and it's going to have to be a reset of what the new form and foundation of money should be. Now, will that be bricks? I don't know. Will that be Bitcoin? I don't know. But there is going to be a, a reset at some point because you know just math is the is the, is the debt spiral yes this is the the, the the definition of the debt spiral like you're going down 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 and exactly it's debt spiral because you cannot break it exactly it's like you have to do it with the religion you're just don't believe it anymore <laughs> yeah it. Yeah, and soon people will just start realizing like, yo, working for a money that steals my economic energy and my time every single year and it's doing and stealing more and more of it every single year, it makes no sense. It doesn't make sense to save money. Like if you're in a country like uh, Nigeria where they're inflating the currency at like two to 300% a year, <laughs> you know, so your money is worth like one third of what it was the year before. It's, it's futile to save your money and, and also in those type of countries, it's very hard to get access to at least a currency that's a, a bit more stable, you know? So you're just trapped in this system of, oh man, I just made so much money and then the next month they print, you know, billions of dollars more and your currency is just getting inflated more because the government just basically is broke, you know, and they're just basically paying off debt with inflated money or with more debt. So they're borrowing from another person <laughs> to pay off the, 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 the interest off the debt. They can't even pay off the principal. So yeah, the entire that's situation. What, that's what they're saying is that the debt market is stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the debt market is completely, it makes absolutely no sense, man. So I'm curious to see how this ends. This is why like I allocated majority of my net worth is in crypto. Because um, at least with crypto, I know what the inflation numbers are of Bitcoin. I can see them on chain, you know, <laughs> and it's not controlled by human. It's controlled by a piece of software. Right. And so I'd rather trust, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> code and software and math than human beings, because human beings have been proven to be corrupt time and time and time again. And um, yeah, I, I feel kind of bad, you know, to see what's going to happen in the future but i think if you don't if you're not positioned properly and you aren't in assets it's going to be very difficult because there is going to be a change in the medium of exchange at some point you know yeah i think the uh the crypto will stay and uh, in same in the same point i think the fiat will cease to exist because it will be needed in some kind of uh scenarios let's say yeah, I mean, I, I, I think fiat, the idea of fiat would not be as bad if maybe, look, I, I'm not trying to say that I'm, I don't like fiat at all, but for it to at least be more sustaining long term, if it was all operated through code and in a way that it wasn't, nobody controlled it and the inflation was actually 
let's say they didn't tax anybody and just like, you know what, we're not going to tax. We're just going to take like one to 2% like every single year. We're just going to add that on to the supply and we're going to use that for a government, uh, public goods and services and et cetera, you know, to help, you know, the, the economy. That would be that'd be okay. I would I would be okay with that. I'm not saying it's the best form or the best option, but the situation right now where they just mm, okay, you decide let's just print twenty billion dollars, you know, <laughs> like yeah, I, I think if it is done reverse, what I mean reverse is like you have the bitcoins, yeah, you're w- walking them, and you're printing this cash which has the value of the bitcoins you have walked, and then mm. I think this will be the real value, like. The cash won't be traceable, yeah. But it will be the value of the bitcoins. Yeah, I mean, I think Bitcoin right now is what it's doing is it's sucking up liquidity slowly, right? Like if you look at it from since inception, it's up what like six million percent, you know, <laughs> since since inception. So I think that when you look at the landscape of, like you said, like you, I'm trying to just piggyback of what you said. I think eventually people will start selling their houses to buy Bitcoin. I think that's going to, there's going to come a time where it's going to be the trading your house against fiat will be futile because it will not be worth anything in, in, in fiat. And it's better to actually have the actual hard asset in Bitcoin and trade against that. And I think we're going to get there probably around like when Bitcoin hits like half a million it's like the million dollar range. I think when people are going to start be looking at that, like, wait, should I? Isn't it better to own Bitcoin? And also Bitcoin can't get confiscated too as well. Like it's easy to liquidate, you know, with, with real estate, it's very hard to liquidate that. Then you got to pay all these different types of taxes and stuff. So I, I do think that um, the tide is turning and I, I'm curious to see, like I said, how the future is going to go. It's good to like hedge, like, uh, you know, try to diversify, which is what I'm doing now. I'm getting into more land and other sort of uh, alternative investment vehicles, you know, just so you have different, you know, asset allocation under your net worth umbrella. But yeah, yeah, like uh, I kind of, you know, agree with where you're going with that, you know, saying like Bitcoin's kind of going to be like that black hole that kind of sucks, sucks in a lot of the liquidity and it, it will be way more valuable than, you know, fiat itself. For sure. Sure, I, I agree with all you said, like, it is, yeah. uh, like people in times of crisis, they are searching the the the, the safe safe heaven or mm-hmm. the holy grail, uh, and basically, if you can show them that something is safe and it has value, everyone will hop on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. Yo, Alex, man. Uh, I, I want to. I don't want to cut this off too short, but <laughs> um, I appreciate you coming on, man. I, I really appreciate you so much. This has been great. We got to do this again another time for sure. Yeah, I hope I bring some kind of value. We don't talk that much about uh, LWAs, but I think this is. In the end, I want to say that the LWA project's time will will come. Like I, di- I don't think it it has hit yet. Yeah, but it will come in the future very soon. When do you, when do you think? What is the ex- expected time of arrival? Like, are you saying like in the next two to three years, or when do you think? I think uh, this is like uh, this is not financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to put that disclaimer, but I think in September, October, if the bull market hits fully, uh, the RWA will be the trend which will pump a lot. So I think All it's a right. very good uh, strategy right now to buy RWA project which have a proven behind that. Wait, before you go, we, we, which ones are you looking at right now? Which project? Yeah. I think there's a lot of interesting projects right now. I don't want to say a certain, but uh, people can look at uh, WebAI or projects like that who has like... Uh, uh, one AI has uh, it's a very small project right now, but their technology has some uh, cutting edge advantage. Basically, I think uh, it will be interesting to look uh, at the projects that have survived this bull trap that happened mm-hmm. right now because the market went up and then go down very fast 
because of yeah. certain news or etc. So I think the projects from the RWA narrative, which survived, will be the next uh, gainers in the bull market. Uh, what I mean by survive, they have uh, hold a certain base point in the drop. When they drop, if they hold a certain base point, yeah. I think this is very bullish to be a gainer in the next bull market. So as an advice, I will just look for a, a project that are in terms of RWA, uh, let's say a project who have a real value. Yes. In terms of uh, like the stable coins have a value in the blockchain because they, in terms of inf infrastructure, uh, because they're helping with the fiat on ramping and etc. Uh, yeah. Certain solutions that have benefit not only in the blockchain space, they could have a benefit for certain one development or etc. But projects that can prove that the benefit they can they can provide will give value to its holders. Like if you like you said, if you stake the USDTs, you will receive a yearly. Yield. If you stake a certain RWA, you will see you will get certain reward. So basically, I think people should look for this. RWAs who uh, have some mechanism for rewarding the their holders mm -hmm. and basically to see if they have uh, how they handle this crash that uh, that was recently and basically I think a lot of gainers will come from this narrative. One last thing before we go because what did you, because I didn't really get to ask you about the, the BlackRock Biddle, the tokenization fund that they have. And do, do you think that, because I, I mean, I, I kind of made this prediction last year in my podcast that uh, the stock exchange will become the block exchange. What, do, you, do you see an entire overhaul in tokenization of stocks into, you know, blockchain or chain, chain to assets? Chained, com chained commodities or chain securities. Yep, that's why they, the BlackRock launched contract on Ethereum, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Basically, they will try to do it and they will probably succeed, I think. Uh, I hope some other players, rather than BlackRock, because they are controlling a lot of things, uh, will hop on, on this rally and talk, tokenize some uh, shares in terms of public companies, because it will be so boring if the BlackRock is on the one who is doing it. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I think we'll, we'll close it off there, man. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? And are you, you're building a project too, right? Yeah, we're building a couple of projects. We're more of incubating them. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to share with them. I, I don't like to make uh, advertisement. Uh, yeah. I think they can they can find me on LinkedIn, Alexander Pekvano, or they can search for our brand, which is uh, uh, kibernatia.com. Uh, and basically, I don't want to show any project or etc. It's uh, <laughs> Kibernatia is a company that's in terms of development, so yeah. they're not showing anything. Yeah, perfect, then perfect. I'm gonna leave a link down below. Do you have any closing thoughts before we go? My closing thoughts is let's have fun and see which will be the gainers of the next bull market. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Uh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you for coming on. This concludes this episode of the Mooncast, man. And peace. Take care, man. <laughs>